Okay. We were treating acute myeloid leukemia with 7 and 3 in 1977. We are still doing the same in 2020. What is the best way forward to change it by 2030? I think the best way forward is to do this deep phenotyping, which will let us look at a patient from the very earliest stage of their disease all the way through to its terminal uh, end, and to find out what distinguishes the disease at its very earliest state. I think the absolute critical key to all cancers is a very early diagnosis, and we like to do this before it ever manifests itself as a disease phenotype the clinician can detect. And if we can do that, we can then use systems approaches to understand the early simplicity that initiates this disease and design therapies to reverse it before it ever manifests itself as a disease. And my argument is this will be the preventive medicine of the 21st century. Superb answer. Thank you. Second question. There are three and a half million papers on cancer 150,000 in 2018 alone, but there's a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and translation to improve therapies. What are we doing wrongly? The most fundamental failure in cancer and cancer therapy is the fact today we diagnose cancers when they're at a very late stage. So the disease-perturbed biological networks that underlie those cancers have become incredibly complicated. And the idea that you could find a single drug that would reverse all of that disease-perturbed complexity is ridiculous in the extreme. So we have to move from waiting until we see the cancer, to having those early biomarkers that tell us the cancer is coming and attack it at that earliest stage. Super. Question number three. The fact that children respond to the same treatment better than adults seems to suggest that cancer biology is different, but also that the host may be different. Since most cancers increase with age, even having good therapy may not matter because the host has become decrepit. Your solution? My feeling is one of the fundamental reasons why cancer in children is easier to deal with is the relevant target cells for cancer have not undergone nearly as many mutations when you're four years old as when you're 90 years old. And those mutations, although they themselves may not be the direct can cancer-inducing mutation, they have the chance of facilitating and extending the power of the cancer. So you, again, always want to deal with cancer in its simplest state. And in a sense, a child gives you the chance to do that because its cells have gone through far fewer uh, generations of, of uh, cell division and mutation than, than those in the adult. So basically back to early detection, even in adults. Even in adults and even in children. children. I mean, what's nice about children, if we get really good early detection there, maybe we can have a 100% cure rate every single time. Without which would using be very the exciting, Without using really toxic drugs. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. You're going to love my fourth question, Lee. If you have, you have great knowledge and experience in this field, if you were given limitless resources to plan a cure for cancer, what will it be? 
if I was given limitless, limitless resources. resources, I would do what I'm planning to do with Providence. I'm proposing that Providence undertake a project where we'll do this deep phenotyping, that is making literally billions of measurements on each patient and follow them longitudinally for a long period of time. And what we know we'll begin to see are transitions from wellness to disease where we can show in the samples that we've taken prior to the time the disease get diagnosed that changes have occurred two or three or even four years prior to that. I would take this million patient population, I would see which tumors can we most easily diagnose at this earliest transition period and I would then use these very powerful systems approaches to identify biomarkers that might let us stratify disease into subtypes, identify relevant drug targets for appropriate kind of therapy, and, and, and most fundamentally come to understand the biology of the earliest stage of the cancer we're looking at. And I would argue if we successfully initiate that and can deal in an early preventative way with one kind of cancer, we can apply that to many kinds of cancers. So the real key is to follow the complexity of human individuals over an extended period of their life to see the transitions and be able to recognize the transitions for what they are. This transition takes you to AML, this transition to breast cancer, this transition to Alzheimer's. We'll be able to, I mean, the really ex conceptually exciting idea is that is the approach for ending all chronic diseases. And I would argue we can identify the earliest transition points for diseases and we can reverse them at this early stage. We spend today 86% of our healthcare dollars on chronic diseases. Suppose in 20 years we didn't have to deal with chronic diseases as we do today. What a transition. We could use all of that money saved to optimize wellness for each of us so we moved into our 90s, mentally alert, physically capable. Amazing. The best answer I've received so far, I have to tell you. And the last question is a philosophical one. Offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancers, palliative but toxic treatments is a service or a disservice in the current landscape. My own gut feeling is, being a healthy individual, that it's a disservice. But that answer is naive and somewhat simplistic. A relevant question is, if you're the person that's facing the choice of what to do and in moving into it, what choice would you make? So what I think we should do today is educate our patients as best we can and give them, offer them that choice. And I would argue many patients, if there weren't horrible, painful consequences, would just as soon let the cancer take its course and die a natural death than to go through the agonizing treatment uh, and, and the depletion of family resources that will leave your, uh, your family bereft for resources in the future. But if in fact the alternative of no treatment is a painful, horrible kind of death, then I think that's something each individual has to make a choice on. My own 
strong feeling would be, I think I'd make the choice for a natural termination that would come earlier. Thank you so much for your thoughtful and amazing answers, especially to this last question. It was a pleasure.